Insomniac Spider-Man 2 is finally here, and critics are raving. Three years after the Miles Morales game, and five years since the original, the highly anticipated sequel is launched to massive acclaim and record-breaking sales for PlayStation, a true testament to not only this series of games, but Spider-Man's lasting cultural appeal. This was easily one of my most anticipated games of all time, as a massive fan of Spider-Man as a whole, and Insomniac's take on the characters. But like great power and great responsibility, with massive hype, comes massive expectations. So was I happy with the follow-up? Short answer, yes. Long answer, yes, but I have a lot of feelings about the game's story. And while I do think overall it delivered an unforgettable experience with some of my favorite moments in Spidey history, it does feel like there were maybe a few pieces missing that could have made the narrative feel a tad more cohesive. But that doesn't mean I don't have a ton to gush about. Spider-Man 2 is a triumph in so many ways, and I'm gonna tell you exactly why. Hey, if you haven't seen them yet, make sure to check out my videos on Marvel's Spider-Man and Spider-Man Miles Morales before you watch this one. And if you're jonesing for more after that, swing through and check out my Spider-Man retrospectives on the various animated series or my videos on Spider-Verse. If you couldn't tell, I really love Spider-Man. Thanks. Also, just a heads up, this is primarily a dissection of Spider-Man 2's narrative, which means there are going to be spoilers throughout the entire video. So this is your last warning. All right, still here? Let's do it. During the production of Insomniac's first Spider-Man game, the the question of including the symbiote suit as an unlockable costume was posed, and since Insomniac really seems to understand the most important aspects of Spidey's history, they rightfully held off and opted to save the inclusion of this suit for when the narrative demanded it. A really smart move if you ask me. It not only placed significance on its inclusion, period, but built hype for the future of the franchise with the fanbase's major anticipation for the symbiote saga. Insomniac was also smart enough to lay down a ton of groundwork in the first game and its spin-off. Harry has a presence in the first game throughout his research stations across New York, which neatly tie into his narrative in this game, and obviously the reveal about the true nature of his absence late in that narrative are key as well. But they also build really effectively from where the previous games left off. The aftermath of May's death, the growing pains for Peter and MJ's reformed relationship, Peter's job loss, Miles' continued grief after losing his father, and his struggles to maintain his hero-slash-life balance. Some of these things are handled really well, while some feel like they needed an extra plot point or two, but we'll get there eventually. One thing the game did exceptionally well was highlight the aforementioned struggle to balance heroism and life responsibilities. As they say, when Spider-Man wins, Peter loses, and the opening of this game just immediately dives back into that struggle. Peter has to abandon his first day teaching at Brooklyn Visions in order to go stop Sandman, a job he desperately needs after the events of the last game. Likewise, Miles ends up ditching a vitally important college prep meeting to stop Marco as well, but I absolutely cannot express how much joy I experienced in this opening sequence of the game. Despite the fact that it's essentially an extended tutorial, which now takes a tad longer given that they need to both intro gameplay for Peter and Miles, this entire battle represents so much that I've wanted to see from a Spidey story, and things I didn't even realize I wanted to see. I had no idea that Kaiju Sandman was something I really needed in a game this badly. Just an overwhelming threat to start the game off on an absolutely epic scale. Even cooler was swinging all the way from Brooklyn to Manhattan with that giant threat on the horizon. But what gave me just an endless dose of serotonin was seeing Miles and Peter as dueling Spideys fully realized. Two Spider-Men working together as partners, having to problem solve on the fly on the biggest scale, utilizing each other's strengths in real time. Obviously, there are still aspects of Peter mentoring Miles in this game, but that's a dynamic we've seen before. The full partnership between the pair hasn't really been seen in this way, and it just got me so stoked. Honestly, the aftermath of this battle was also something I really loved to see for very unexpected reasons. Sandman's tirade leaves Lower Manhattan absolutely absolutely buried in sand, with buildings destroyed and people trapped, showcasing not just the Spideys helping the people who were trapped in the sandstorm, but firefighters and first responders as well. Not to be too dramatic, but I would be shocked if the imagery wasn't at least partially inspired by Ground Zero in the wake of 9-11, when this exact area of Manhattan was buried in debris. It's just nice to highlight non-superheroes doing their best to help in the aftermath of a disaster. Where the opening mission in the first game, the takedown of Wilson Fisk, was actually the inciting incident that created the power vacuum in New York City, this game plays it a bit differently. Sandman's attack was actually a warning sign of what would be the major inciting incident for the game. If you need help, all you have to do is ask. You're the ones who are gonna need help when they come for you. 
This inciting incident is of course Craven's entrance into New York City, which as we learn has actually already happened. Sandman was just one of his first targets. This is a pretty interesting way to introduce the story, but I think it works really well. Lead off with an absolutely massive threat to really set the stage, and then reveal that this threat was actually just scared of something even worse. I've seen some people complain about the non-Spidey aspects of this game, but to me, they are absolutely quintessential to this Spider-Man experience. Spider-Man doesn't mean anything if we aren't connected to Peter Parker, and the first Peter Parker sequences of the game are genuinely some of my favorites. May's death from the end of the last game is still looming over the events of this one. Peter lives in her house and struggles to pay her mortgage, still stricken with grief from her loss, showcased by his inability to donate any of her old things. I was so thankful that they brought May back in this flashback sequence, one of the best emotional moments of the game, relating to Peter and highlighting exactly what he needs to learn over the course of this story. Balance is a process, not a destination. I'm still working on that. Oh, come on. But even more than the May scene, I loved Harry's proper introduction. Obviously, we really only got to infer info about Harry and Pete's relationship through his messages at the research stations, and his letter explaining his illness later in the first game. As Spidey fans, we know Peter and Harry's friendship is important, but Insomniac didn't just rush past this important step for these versions of the characters, despite the fact that they're catching back up later in their lives. I was thinking... We might roll like we used to. I cannot express how much I loved this Peter and Harry mission, just riding bikes from May's house to Midtown High, shooting hoops, catching up, and reminiscing about their childhood together. These are the vitally important human moments that make Spider-Man stories matter. If these relationships don't mean anything to the audience, the Spider-Man stakes don't matter either. The best Spider-Man stories are also fundamentally Peter Parker stories, or Miles Morales stories. I don't care if these sequences aren't action-packed, Experiencing these best friends reconnect not only warmed my heart, but went such a long way to establish why this friendship is important to this narrative. And that Shin's needle drop, I mean, come on. In the middle of this, we also get a flashback mission, showing some of the events in their high school days that made Pete and Harry such great friends, coinciding with the most affecting moment in Harry's life, the death of his mother. Not only his biggest loss, but the first realization that he may succumb to the same illness that she did. I love that Harry's research stations in the first game sort of telegraphed his more altruistic nature, inspired by his mother, attempting to utilize Oscorp's tech to actually help the world. It leads perfectly into the narrative here. I got a second chance, and I'm gonna take advantage of that. But I need you with me, Pete. We're gonna heal the world. What I think works so great about this storyline for Peter is the way the goals and possibilities of the Emily May Foundation perfectly line up with that all-important mantra, with great power comes great responsibility. Peter is on the fence about helping Harry because of his Spider-Man responsibilities, but the reality of the ambitious nature of Harry and Peter's foundation is that it could help so many people. When I was in treatment, all I could think about was, what would I do if I survived? And I kept hearing my mom's voice telling me that our planet is in trouble. And it's my responsibility to save it. I think this genuinely asks an important and daring question for a Spider-Man story. Are there ways that Peter's talents could be better served in regards to great responsibility? Stopping these big threats as a superhero is obviously important, but solving systemic and fundamental problems with the planet we live on could potentially help on a massive, massive scale. I think it's a really interesting idea that this story grapples with, and most importantly, there are personal stakes at the center that tie to the incoming symbiote story very well thematically, but we'll get there soon. This game obviously co-stars Miles, and while there are aspects of his narrative that work very well, I sadly think that he wasn't as intertwined with the overall story nearly as much as I wanted him to be, which is a huge bummer because I truly loved his story in his solo game. It's a tad frustrating because you can sort of see the places where just a little bit more could have gone a really, really long way. That being said, other aspects of his arc are so damn great in isolation. As a new Spider-Man, it makes sense that Miles Miles would struggle even more with his work-life balance, especially with the major life changes that come with prepping for college. They set up a lot of really great stuff here. A scene that particularly moved me was Rio telling Miles about the man she's been dating. I'm sure there's some spider stuff I can be doing. I can give you some privacy. No, 
know, I'd like him to meet you. Though I do really wish that this had maybe played a bigger role in the story overall, since Insomniac always hits with these important relationship moments. But the aspect of Miles' story that does absolute hit throughout to the end is his internal struggle with Martin Lee. More on that to come. Let's talk Craven, because I think they handled his story mostly really effectively. I do think it's fair to argue that having an entire army of hunters isn't exactly the most Craven thing to do, but I think it mostly works in this game. For one, I just think it's the nature of these kind of video games. There's always got to be some kind of overwhelming threat to the entire city. And I think the story justifies Craven's actions here, utilizing the army to capture his opponents for him to battle one-on-one. -on -one. The reveal that he's hunted down and killed the vast majority of Spidey's villains, many of whom we fought in the first game, is such a brutal way to build him up as a threat. But I think the most interesting thing they do with Craven here are his motivations. They reveal that Craven has some kind of terminal illness and that his endless search for a worthy opponent isn't just his ego as a hunter, but his attempts to go out on his own terms. He won't allow illness to make him look weak and end his life in a way that he perceives as pathetic. He wants to go out at the top of his game, dying a death that he feels is worthy of his pedigree. And obviously, he actually succeeds here. I just think that's a really cool take on Craven. And this is a good lead-in for the symbiote and Venom storyline. And while I wish the Venom section of the game had been a bit more robust, I think the execution of Peter's arc and his symbiote storyline is probably the highlight of the game overall. For one, I think the new entry point into the symbiote arc was a really smart adaptation. I know some people likely have misgivings with them using Harry as Venom instead of Eddie Brock, but I love that they opted to use the symbiote in a new way, as it basically keeps Harry's terminal illness at bay. It thematically ties to Harry and Peter's goals, healing the world, and also gives everyone a more personal connection to its existence. There are way more stakes when the thing keeping your best friend alive is actually an evil you need to destroy. And it makes the scene where the symbiote transfers from Harry to Peter to save his life much more impactful. I've seen a lot of very bad takes that Peter was nerfed in this game or that they propped up other characters to make him look bad, and I just really wish people were willing to engage with Peter's story here. I just cannot relate to the people who need their favorite characters to be the biggest, strongest boys rather than empathize with the actual journey the character is going on. May's flashback scene pretty explicitly spells this out and telegraphs exactly why Peter struggles over this narrative, a lack of balance. She tells him about all of the responsibilities she took on in school when she was his age. Every year, I wanted a new feather in my cap. But when I tried to add honor roll student on top, I fell apart. Instead of being good at a few things, I wasn't good at anything. So, I scaled back. In the first game, Peter was mostly isolated. He pretty much only spent his time Spider-Manning, and he even got evicted because of it. In this game, Peter now has a girlfriend, he's taken on May's mortgage, and despite his reservations, knowing that it will eat into his responsibility as Spider-Man, he takes on the job at the Emily May Foundation with Harry. He does the opposite of scale back. Peter absolutely struggles over the course of this game, and it isn't to prop up other characters, it's to highlight exactly what he needs to learn, not only as Spider-Man, but especially as Peter Parker. Peter's embrace of the symbiote suit is basically his refusal to actually acknowledge this is an issue. He essentially uses the symbiote as performance-enhancing drugs, and Yuri Lowenthal rightfully played this part of the story as though he was going through an addiction. I need this suit. It makes me a better Spider-Man. You just want it for yourself. Peter slowly succumbing to the symbiote is so well done. And surprise, surprise, it's the section of the narrative where he struggles the least fighting a Spider-Man and struggles the most in his personal life. It's definitely not an accident, guys. They even adapt the iconic sequence where the symbiote uses Peter's body while he's asleep, first seen in Peter Parker, The Spectacular Spider-Man number 95, and expertly adapted in the Spectacular Spider-Man animated series. What I love most about this sequence is that it puts you in MJ's shoes, which really highlights how terrifying Peter has become, basically playing out like a horror movie. And this really shows how deeply Peter has failed in his personal life by embracing the suit, nearly killing MJ in the process. Peter wakes up on a park bench the next morning without a care in the world. He ignores texts from MJ and even from Rio, who is desperately searching for Miles after he was kidnapped by Craven. And then Peter is immediately awful to Harry, who is now dying without the symbiote. This suit is the only reason I'm still alive. Yeah, it's pretty great, isn't it? Why don't you pop some more pills and say what you're really feeling? Hey, 
Don't. Peter slowly losing himself as the suit takes over is so, so well handled. Easily one of my favorite aspects of the narrative, both in execution and how it ties to the story thematically. Sadly, despite really high highs, I think the symbiote story loses a bit of steam after the introduction of Venom. But that's such a key aspect of the climax, let's talk about some other villains first. This game does an unbelievable job implementing so many iconic villains and side characters into the gameplay and narrative. Obviously, the opening tutorial kaiju fight with Sandman is incredible, but that's just how the game opens. There is a massive multi-part chase and fight with the lizard. The implementation of Kurt Connors into the story was really well handled. There's clearly a history with Spidey, but he's been given a second chance, trying to help Harry and Norman reel in the symbiote as a treatment for Harry's condition. I particularly loved how we saw the more familiar lizard design from the comics, more humanoid with the lab coat, before he further mutated into his massive monster, thanks to Craven's interference. A really cool cool video gamey way to escalate the threat without ignoring the character's history. All of these sequences also went a long way to help sell Peter succumbing to the symbiote's influence, as taking down a literal dinosaur isn't exactly the easiest task. One of the highlights of the game is a mission and fight sequence involving Miles, Felicia, and a wand that can create portals, heisted from the Sanctum Sanctorum. For one, on a technical and visual level, this is just top tier, unbelievable stuff. As Miles, you're chasing Felicia through New York City while she jumps around using this portal magic. You seamlessly traverse huge distances, cruising through each portal in real time. My jaw was on the floor for the entire sequence. It's also, I think, a fun use of larger Marvel lore, which in general I feel mixed about in these games. While we don't see Doctor Strange, it's clear he and Wong were protecting this wand, and we even get a Wong name drop when they take the wand back after the mission. Sometimes it's hard to believe that such massive threats would go completely unimpeded by other heroes like the Avengers, when they clearly have a presence in New York in this universe, given Avengers Tower. Not that I want the Avengers to show up in this game, I'd personally prefer it to be more Spidey focused, but referencing the larger universe sometimes makes it feel muddier and less believable. But I guess that could just be a quirk of this universe? I'm very curious if things will build out in this world even further with the upcoming Wolverine game, but regardless, I thought this smaller reference to Doctor Strange and Wong worked really well in this case. I also really love that they opted to have Miles undertake this Felicia mission, forcing both of them to make judgment calls about people they don't have any real history with. Felicia doesn't know if she can trust Miles, and Miles has been explicitly told that he can't trust Felicia. He's put on the spot and has to make his own decision about Felicia's intentions. Spider-Man was right about you. You only care about yourself. Look, kid. Not that it's your business. My girlfriend's in Paris. And I got her into trouble with some bad people. Have you ever done something for love? This is such a great Spider-Man moment for Miles. While Miles has really come into his own as Spidey over these three games, he still looks to Peter and MJ for advice, especially going into a situation like this one, with an adversary he's unfamiliar with. So to be told explicitly not to trust Felicia, but then to make his own decision in the heat of the moment, one that prioritizes the well-being of others, perfectly Spider-Man. These are important steps for Miles as he grows as a hero, and while I still have some issues with how Miles was implemented into the story overall, there are some clear exceptions, particularly as mentioned before with his Martin Lee arc. This entire story is played so, so beautifully, with Miles unexpectedly seeing Lee as he's being transferred and leading to a story-long struggle with his feelings of vengeance. I've seen some people question the story point, and I honestly just have to question that media literacy, as though seeing the man responsible for his father's death face-to-face -face wouldn't be deeply traumatizing, especially when it wasn't expected and ends with that man's escape. The Miles and Lee plot points are some of the highlights of the game, with Craven even forcing the pair to fight each other in a gladiator-like arena after he kidnaps both of them. A really wild setup for a great boss fight, ending with Miles once again making a heroic decision and showing that he's working towards rejecting the feelings of vengeance that he's been struggling with. When you're out, find Spider-Man. <laughs> While Lee has obviously done unforgivable things, I think they do a great job showcasing his deep regret for giving in to his vengeance. He could have fled after Miles saved him, but he actually found Peter and told him where to find Miles, which leads to another of the best sequences in the game, Peter's fight with Kraven, and then with Miles. The Peter v Kraven fight is excellent, showing Peter give in to some of his worst symbiote tendencies, while Kraven acknowledges that despite this, he still hasn't fully given in. Beautiful. But you still hold back, kill 
or be killed. God, this image of symbiote Peter holding Craven goes so hard. But this leads into probably my favorite boss fight of the entire game, as well as, to me, the peak emotional moment. All I want is to save you. I'm the hero. I don't get sick. Miles being forced to fight his mentor and friend to rescue him from the pits of his addiction is so raw, so emotional. I think it is far and away the best depiction of Peter overcoming the symbiote that we've ever seen. And it fits the ideas and themes behind the suit's control so perfectly. The classic bell tower scene is obviously iconic for a reason, but with the way this story treats the suit like an addiction, something Peter slowly becomes dependent on at the expense of his loved ones, it's so much more beautiful to see that addiction be overcome through an intervention from somebody who actually cares about him. I can't let this go. I'm finally everything everyone needs me to be. Yeah, you don't even answer my calls anymore, man. What about MJ? You could have killed her. I know you're hurting, Pete, but you're better than this. I know, I know, but no. The way that Peter rips the symbiote off of himself with the vocal support from Miles is genuinely perfect. It shows that without the support of his loved ones, Peter wouldn't have overcome this struggle, a struggle with something that is simply more powerful than himself, which ties beautifully to those allusions to addiction, as well as the major arc and lesson Peter needs to reconcile with in this game, that after 10 years of being Spider-Man, he cannot do everything himself. He needs to accept help where he can and find balance in his life. Miles, I'm sorry. Thank you for everything. It's what Spider-Man do. <clears throat> Spider-Man didn't save me back there. Miles did. It's so sad to me to see some people complain about these aspects of the story simply because they don't think Miles should be able to beat a symbiote-powered Peter. Besides the fact that Miles didn't beat him, if you can't understand the thematic resonance and appreciate the struggles of the characters in the story being told, are you even interested in storytelling? Peter overcoming an overwhelming power with the support of his friends and loved ones is so much more Spider-Man than some power fantasy face-off. This game is is filled with some absolutely major high points like this one. Some of my favorite moments I've experienced in any Spider-Man media. The conclusion of the Miles and Martin Lee arc is the other aspect of Miles' story that absolutely hits. The narrative did such a great job showcasing the trauma from Miles' father's death, unexpectedly consuming him. In the heat of the moment, he's faced with something he hadn't really even considered. And this all culminates in one of my favorite sequences. Lee and Miles working together inside of Peter's subconscious, getting to the core of his deepest traumas and helping him unlock the anti-venom suit. Part of why I love this is because of what it tells us about Peter, but first I want to talk about how beautifully it ties up Miles' arc. Miles is literally forced to team up with the source of his deepest trauma here, knowing it's something he has to do for the good of his friend. But it gives him the opportunity to understand Lee and his actions on a more fundamental level, which in turn helps him learn to be a better hero and a better person. Why did you do it? What did you want? Revenge. Norman Osborne's the reason my parents are dead. So I dedicated my life to making his hell. Instead, you lost your father. Peter lost me. And I was too stubborn to see I had become what I despised most. <sighs> Sorry, Miles. Miles was the next in line in a cycle of trauma and vengeance. Norman's actions killed Lee's parents. Lee's actions killed Miles' father. But Miles broke the cycle by not giving in to that vengeance, despite feeling it. I won't forgive you. It's just not in me. But I can't carry this hate for you anymore, man. So let's set things right. You and me. Miles proved himself to be a real hero by acknowledging the pain and hurt Lee inflicted on him, refusing to forgive him, but still pushing forward and being the better man, moving on and breaking that cycle. It's a great arc for the character, and it also once again brings everything back to Norman Osborn. Everything in Insomniac's Spider-Man universe can be traced back 
to Norman Osborn. Unfortunately, these are the best examples of Miles being properly intertwined with Peter's narrative in this game. I love his involvement in helping Peter remove the symbiote suit and his arc in the Martin Lee saga, but probably my biggest issue with the game as a whole is that Miles feels separated from the narrative a lot of the time, which is a big missed opportunity, and it prevents the ending beats from feeling as satisfying as they could have. But in order to properly analyze all of that, we've got to go over the remainder of the Venom arc. I think the fact that Insomniac found a new in for the symbiote story is wildly impressive. Obviously, the key aspects are still there. It's a living being from space that fuses with its host, but the idea that the symbiotic abilities are being harnessed to heal Harry's illness is so, so effective in this story. I was a tad concerned when they announced that Venom would be someone it hasn't been in the comics, but in execution, I think it mostly worked great. For one, we get a truly, genuinely loving friendship between Peter and Harry here, probably the most wholesome we've ever seen them, which really adds to the emotional state. Stakes, not just the stakes of trying to rescue Harry after he's fused with the suit and become Venom, but the stakes while you're wearing the symbiote as Peter, knowing that Harry is succumbing to his illness without the symbiote's aid, and the sad realization that it is far too dangerous to actually give the symbiote back to Harry. I saved your life, and you won't save mine? Do you want me to die? On top of that, the resentment that built up in Harry while Peter was using the suit is exactly what drew the symbiote back to Harry and caused him to mutate into Venom, making Pete feel responsible for the fate of his friend and the havoc he wreaked upon New York City. I'm a broken record, but these games do such a great job adding relationship-based emotional stakes to all of the actual superhero drama. It's the secret sauce. But how can you talk about Venom without raving about how much fun it is to play as him in this Oscorp breakout scene? Sequence. I had so much fun throughout this entire game, but the 10 to 20 minutes where you are Venom, busting through walls, just throwing guards into oblivion, next level stuff. Obviously culminating in one of the most hardcore sequences we've ever seen in Spider-Man. Venom versus Kraven. The fight isn't particularly hard, but I think this accomplishes two things. For one, it almost makes it feel like a reward for the difficult battles leading up to this point, and two, it makes Venom feel like an absolutely unstoppable force. After a tough fight against Kraven earlier, experiencing Venom just absolutely decimate Kraven really makes you wonder how the hell you're ever going to stop Venom himself as Spider-Man. I don't think I need to say much about the decapitation scene, just an absolutely unreal real moment in Spidey history. I lost my mind. I also really love the idea that Harry's wants and desires are fully meshing with the symbiotes, but the symbiote is still using Harry. The scene after where he goes to his mother's grave is excellent. What did I just do? Don't be scared, honey. You finally have the power to do what we've always wanted. We're going to heal the world. This manipulation from the symbiote slash Venom works really well here. By using the symbiote as a device that has literally healed Harry of his illness, and then combining that with his desire to do right by his mother and heal the world, you've got a pretty ingenious reframing of a symbiote takeover of Earth. The symbiote wanting to consume the world and add it to the hive mind, and Harry wanting to rid the world of its illnesses and issues. All that being said, I think a lot of the stretch of the game from Venom's introduction through to the final battle leaves a bit to be desired. There are still a ton of great moments in isolation. This is where we get the wrap up of Miles and Martin Lee's arc, which I already raved about. Plus, there's an incredible boss battle against MJ as Scream. But as a whole, it feels a bit undercooked. As a spectacle, Peter vs. MJ's Scream is next level. The Scream design is amazing, and the fight is a ton of fun, but I think they missed the mark laying the groundwork for the relationship struggles at its core. As with many great Insomniac Spidey conflicts, the relationship at the center is key. During the fight, Fight, MJ slash Scream unloads all of her resentments about their relationship and his life as Spider-Man that she's been keeping pent up inside. And I think that's a great idea on paper, I just don't think the game did enough to pre-establish these resentments. There is some groundwork, Peter refusing to accept MJ's help early in the game, and obviously treating everyone badly while he was ensnared with the symbiote suit, but I think they could have done a bit more to really showcase how Peter's double life itself was negatively affecting MJ. The symbiote suit feels like such a specific circumstance 
worlds, I would have preferred to see a bit more of the difficulties associated with just being Spider-Man's girlfriend. That can't be easy. As I mentioned before, I also think Miles' integration into the story overall could have been handled much better. There are some really great ideas in regards to Peter's relationship with both Harry and Miles, and how the evolution of those friendships could create resentment between the two of them. For the small section of the game where Harry becomes Agent Venom and sort of takes Miles' place as he and Peter start doing superhero stuff together, it's clear that this starts to draw out some insecurities from Miles, with Peter ignoring him more and more often. But at the end of the game, Harry slash Venom really lays into Miles, claiming that he's become Harry's replacement in Peter's life. And I think this is a great idea that is sadly half-baked in this story. We definitely see how Miles starts to resent Pete during the Harry situation, but we never see anything in regards to Harry's resentment of Miles. This would have been a perfect place to tie more of Miles into the main story. What we should have gotten was one mission where Miles teams up with Harry's Agent Venom. We could have seen them get a bit competitive in regards to their relationship with Pete and their crime fighting. Harry having a longer relationship with Peter, but Miles having more Spider-Man experience with him. It could have built out their unique relationship to be a bit more compelling, while also really forecasting how those resentments could build up once Harry is full-blown Venom. We've also got to talk about Miles' new suit, which has obviously been discussed a lot on social media already, though that's mostly been design-focused. I actually don't think the design is all that bad, but the color palette really sucks. The alternate palettes already go a long way to improve how the suit looks, even though the hair out of the top is not my preference. But I don't have nearly as much of an issue with the suit as I do the complete lack of any reason for it to have happened in the narrative. Miles literally just pops in towards the end of the game with the new suit on. We never see him create it, and the justification just feels really weak. It's time for a Miles Morales original, you know? I don't dislike the idea of Miles sporting a new suit after going through a change. It worked like gangbusters in the Spider-Man Miles Morales game. But if you're not going to justify it in the story, why even do it? Why present it in such an anticlimactic way? It actually feels like there's just a missing story beat between the wrap-up of the Martin Lee arc and this scene with the introduction of the suit. So much of Miles' journey in his solo game and in this game are about the community that he's surrounded himself with. I would have loved to see his personal relationships in his community play a role in the creation of his new suit. One of the key side characters in his life is Haley, who just so happens to know Miles' secret identity and is a street artist. What if we got a scene after the Martin Lee wrap-up where Miles opens up to Haley about letting go of that vengeance, about moving forward with his life, and about how he feels like a new person because of the weight that is lifted. And what if Haley then used her street art abilities to help Miles design a new suit? That obviously doesn't have to be how it goes down, I just think there's a missing piece here. And if you're not going to bridge that gap, don't make the new suit a story point. That's just my take. There are just a handful of these totally solid ideas, many of which really lend themselves to the themes of the game, but in execution, aren't quite robust enough to feel fully justified. Combine this with the fact that I just don't think they utilize Miles quite thoroughly enough in the overall narrative, and sadly, it's enough for me to say that compared to the previous two games, I found this one to be a tad underwhelming. Of course, as I've gushed about a ton of the game already, I still had an all-around incredible experience. I just didn't feel the same level of emotional impact that I did at the end of the first game, or even the Miles Morales game. But for some of its main story shortcomings, there are so many absolutely peak Spider-Man moments in the side content. Here's a tip, if you didn't play the Flame side missions, do that. Following up Yuri Watanabe's dismissal as police captain from the Spider-Man PS4 DLC, she's now operating as another vigilante, Wraith. These missions do a great job showing Peter and Yuri attempting to reconcile their weird relationship after the events of that DLC, with them both having drastically different ideas ideas of what is and isn't okay in their vigilantism. But the major reveal at the end of these missions is that the homicidal cult leader of the flame that you've been tracking the entire time is none other than Cletus Cassidy, or at least that's one of his false identities. And his entire plan was to retrieve one of the symbiotes being kept by Oscorp. I have a strong feeling that this is their big narrative plan for the DLC. A lot of fans were underwhelmed by Hammerhead in the first game's extra content. With this in mind, and Carnage being such a massively popular character, character, I am fully expecting we'll be getting substantial Carnage-focused DLC down the line. But even beyond these exciting Spidey setups, I think where the game really shines is in its smaller, more human moments. Obviously, the main missions have a few of these. The bike ride with Harry, the trio hanging out at Coney Island in particular, but there are a couple optional side missions that, to me, are just 
perfect. There's one in Brooklyn where you have to track down a woman's missing grandfather. You run around Brooklyn going to various places he visits until you find him on a park bench and you just sit with him while you wait for his granddaughter. I propose to my wife here, right here, where we sit. Man, you're making the rest of us look bad. How'd you ask? These moments of human connection are what makes Spider-Man a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. The connection to the people he saves is so vital to that Spider-Man experience, and I think this is actually something they continued from the Miles Morales spin-off and fully improved upon from the first Spider-Man game, where sometimes the missions could start to feel a bit too much like you're just a spider cop. A genuine focus on the people that Spider-Man helps. But there isn't any better example than the Howard side mission. You might remember Howard in the first game is the guy you had to collect pigeons for. A bit of a tedious collect-a-thon, but over the course of that mission, you learn about Howard and that he watches over the pigeons in honor of his dead wife. This time, Howard asks you to find a place for those pigeons to relocate, but not before you sit with him while he just observes the beauty that the city has to offer, looking out over the water, reflecting on his life. I'm finally going on an adventure, but I want to set my birds free first. Let them see the world outside this city. NYC is the best place in the world for pigeons, Can you though. take them up north for me? Somewhere peaceful? But they need you, Howard. It's their time. As you escort the birds to their new home, the vibes are just genuinely immaculate. Needle dropping the song Seabird by the Alessi brothers, I cannot describe the emotions I felt just flying across the river helping these birds find their new home. I've never experienced anything like it in a video game. And as I'm sure many figured out, this was Howard's goodbye. His last act to watch over those birds and do right by them. He's on a new adventure now. And his wife's with him. I don't think Spider-Man 2 is a perfect game, but in its best moments, it is truly, truly special. And even though I think the story could have been a bit more cohesive overall, I also think that it still really hits in its biggest emotional moments. The final battle with Venom is mostly really great. I particularly loved that the first part takes place at Midtown High, where you became friends with Harry, and the second takes place at the Emily May Foundation, where they reconnected in their desire to help the world. I do wish that the second half of this fight had been a tag team effort with Miles, mostly because this is where the lack of substance in the Harry slash Miles relationship was really showcased. Putting Peter back in the picture would add more of the emotional stakes. However, when the big emotional moments between Peter and Harry arrived, they hit. Let's heal the world, Pete. Together. Peter was intent on not losing someone else, not after May. But Peter doesn't get to choose. I love you. Though we do have this great moment where Miles resuscitates Harry, he still ends up in a vegetative state. It's clear that they're using Norman's grief and last ditch efforts to save Harry to kickstart the Green Goblin story, which I'm really looking forward to, but for all intents and purposes, in this moment, Peter loses Harry. Just after getting his best friend back, he loses him. And this is why I think this game does a really great job selling the idea that Peter needs a break as Spidey. It's all about balance. And with the physical and emotional burden weighing on Peter, Peter, after 10 years of being Spider-Man without a break, Peter has lost that balance. When Miles and Lee are navigating Peter's subconscious, we see the literal corpses of Spidey's villains ensnared in the symbiote, telling us that these events leave a lasting traumatic impact on Peter. They never really leave him, even after he's won a battle or saved the day. And of course there's the fact that Peter is obviously still reeling from the loss of May, his last family by blood. He lost his mentor and role model in the previous story. He's lost his best friend in this one, and while struggling to maintain that balance, he gave himself to an evil outside force that nearly ruined his relationships, nearly killed MJ, the love of his life. By taking a Spidey hiatus, Peter can reform the Emily May Foundation. He can use his other great power to take up great responsibility, help people on a more systemic and foundational level. And with Miles capable and willing to to take up that mantle of Spider-Man, giving the city the hope that Peter knows it needs, Peter can enter this new chapter knowing the world is in good hands. Not just because the city still has Spider-Man, but because of the work he can do without that obligation 
that will also help change the world. Peter found his balance. And no, I don't think that means he's done being Spider-Man. Because as we know, there's still one final chapter to come. And with the tease of Cindy Moon's silk, the prospect of Green Goblin entering the picture, and even of Doc Ock returning, there are so many more Spidey stories to tell. And I cannot wait to see them. Johnny! Two I stay mellow watching Johnny two cellos. He talks cartoons, he's a really cool fellow. He keeps you posted on adult cartoons. If that's what you're into, then grab a spoon and a very big bowl of your favorite cereal. Feels like Saturday morning cartoon material. Johnny two cellos, watch him on YouTube. Now enjoy this groove and bust a move.